Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We'll get started here in a few minutes, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It looks like we've got several people joining right now. So we'll give them just a minute and then we'll get started. You Thank you, Heidi. Right there for the instructions, I guess, maybe so people are with me. Yes, and I'll copy. Okay. Is there a way to make the your screen bigger? Or the, if not, no problem, but just. Okay, that's good. I just put some uh, some instructions in the chat. If if you all want to start introducing yourself and answering the question in the chat, we'll get started here in just a moment.
All right, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Good morning. My name is Heidi McPherson. For those of you who I might not know, I'm with the American Heart Association and one of three of your co-leads for the coalition alongside Dr. Srila Sharma and Tan Tanweer Kalimala. We've got a full agenda today. Uh, we're gonna start out with the introductions. Um, it looks like a lot of you have, have seen the instructions in the chat. If you could take a few minutes to introduce yourselves there. Um, and then we're gonna do a, an overview of the coalition's progress over the past quarter. Um, we have Abel Chaco from Harris County Public Health, who will be presenting on the Harris Cares Report, which lays out some of their um, recommendations for building a healthier Harris County um, and really aligns with the work that we're doing here in the coalition. And um, then we'll have updates from each of the work groups on the progress that they're making. And at the end, we will take some time for community announcements. So please um, be prepared to share what y'all are doing there. And we'll wrap up with next steps at 10 o'clock. Without further ado, um, in addition to the introductions that you all are doing in the chat, we wanted to welcome a couple of new members to the steering committee. So first, Deborah Ganelian, sorry, um, uh, at Memorial Herman, um, who's joined the steering committee, and then Misty Mausalanza with Univision, um, as well as Dr. Jemima John, who's with UT Health, um, and working with Dr. Srila Sharma. Um, and for, for those of you who are new to the coalition, um, we have um, the, the work group representations and the co-leads of those work groups also serve on the steering committee and help guide this work forward. Um, and uh, so, so we're happy to have a couple of new members. Um, I, I want to, Dr. John, do you want to just say a few words about your research and, and the work that you're going to bring to the coalition? Um, because really, you're going to be focusing on our work a significant amount of your time. Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Jemima John. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UT Health. I am the first Stanley Scholar, which is um, a joint appointment across the UT uh, Medical, McGovern Medical School and the UT School of Public Health. I don't know if I said this, but I'm Dr. Sharma's postdoctoral fellow. Um, I, my background is in epidemiology, biostatistics, and social and behavioral health. And prior to, to coming back to UT School of Public Health and the medical school, I was at MD Anderson, where a bulk of my research focused on health disparities um, research across Black and Hispanic populations living in Houston. And the focus of the research primarily involved looking at social and contextual factors, as well as demographic correlates of physical activity behaviors, dietary behaviors, and related outcomes. And so I look forward to bringing that health disparities focus and expertise to the team. I've already started talking with Heidi and Srila about perhaps looking at um, organizational capacity to address food insecurity in Houston. What does that look in terms of policies, organizational structure, and, um, and so forth. Um, and I look forward to being part of the team. Thank you for having me today. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. All right, moving along in our agenda. Um, just a reminder of our vision of health equity for all Greater Houston residents with the mission to establish impactful, collective, sustainable, data-driven systems to promote health equity. So moving that towards that mission, um, it, we're uh, over actually now 300 members strong, uh, representing over 100 organizations. Um, Lots of lots of progress, but lots more work to be done, particularly during this this time of the pandemic has really underscored um, the importance of our shared work. And the need for the collective work of us to come together and step outside of the silos. So looking at the structure of the coalition. Um, we wanted to just share this high level updated work. So that everybody, and because we have some who are new here this morning as well. So we've got our work groups, which right now there's 53 members, or 53 organizations who are participating in the eight work groups. 
Um, around these work group are, are many, uh, many others, um, clearly with the, the, the large number of, uh, of you all in, engaged who are stakeholders and community members with interests in, in helping to move this work along. And then the steering committee, so the co-chairs of those work groups, um, represents 15 organizations and then the backbone support really makes sure that we all come together and move things along. And a reminder too of our road map. So here in 2020, um, the collective impact framework that we're following is really focusing right now and you'll hear a lot about landscape scans, and work that we're doing in identifying what are the gaps and the opportunities for us to improve what's happening in addressing social determinants of health and food security specifically. Um, and what are the common metrics that we bring forward for us to use across our organizations. As we move towards the end of the year, we're really hopeful that we'll be able to have some of those template interventions and recommendations there. And that refers back to what some of Dr. Jemima John was just speaking about. So when we look at a high level of the progress of what we're doing, each of those work groups has built out their work plans for the year and is making progress. More on that as we get through the agenda today and building out that map of where do we wanna end up in five years? How do we actually begin to move the needle and have some of the outcomes that we desire? And what is the budget? What is that gonna take? We've had a few um, contributions from HEB, Community Health Choice and Humana for promoting some of this work. We know there's more needed though to make it really come alive. And then coming out of February's event, we began the charter um, for what is the agreement of how do we bring this system and ecosystem into, into being. Um, and, and the first step, which was identified back in that um, convening in February, was building out the community information exchange uh, infrastructure so that we can coordinate care across our organizations. Um, that requires significant investment and we are thrilled that UT Health has been able to commit 250,000 to getting that work started. We know there's more again needed, um, but that is a good start for us to begin the work. So thank you to the leadership at UT Health. There's a full progress report, which has been posted. Again, this will come out in the, in, in the materials after the meeting. It's linked here, um, so you can read the details behind these high levels uh, reports out. And then moving along, the um, charter recommendations. You guys saw these in the last report, but just really looking at what is that infrastructure, building out that infrastructure, starting with the Community Information Exchange or CIE, and looking at how do we link across institutions in order to have this impact on health outcomes. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Srila Sharma to talk about what is the progress that's being made um, in the plans for the development of the Community Information Exchange. Thanks, Heidi. And this is just a, a recap of uh, the landscape that we've seen now many times uh, before, where on the left-hand side, uh, we have the healthcare institutions um, who are in various ages and stages uh, of screening for food insecurity and providing a response to uh, their patients who screen positive. Um, and then in the, you see the, the, there's the electronic medical records where the information is documented. Uh, and then on the right hand side are the, uh, uh, some of the social service providers uh, that are engaged in that response in some way or the other. Um, I think the part that we also have a, the health information exchange in the middle that allows us to um, uh, synthesize and aggregate the information and the healthcare uh, side of space, but uh, we do not, uh, as we all know, have a, a similar system in the community side of space. So, for example, linking the social service agencies um, uh, to 
make those uh, warm referrals and closing the loops, but also uh, taking it one step further and understanding the, the, the root causes and drivers of these uh, social determinants of health issues uh, and assessing the impacts of uh, these investments on, uh, on various outcomes. Uh, so next slide, Heidi. So we are putting together, we are in the, uh, definitely in the initial stages of putting together the blueprint for a community information exchange. Uh, these are just kind of the very high level goals that we would um, achieve as a result of uh, uh, this work together. Um, just, I think a couple of high points, uh, you know, we don't have the time to <laughs> go deep into a CIE, um, uh, but of course a lot of this will be uh, unveiled as we take those next steps forward. But just a couple of high level points about the CIE is that it is, um, it, the, the intent is to link the existing platforms together uh, versus trying to pull everyone on one platform. There's, there's a lot of good work happening around the city and uh, it, uh, organizations are already, they've made investments into various platforms. Uh, we don't want to now create one more platform to where everybody has to um, further uh, uh, you know, sign on to the intent is to create a, a federated model, if you will, um, to uh, to link the work that's already happening. Um, so the way I like to think about it is this is kind of, you know, there's a lot of work happening in Harris County uh, within the organizations and between organizations, but it, the first step would be to have this uh, ecosystem in place where um, at least on the social service agency side, we would be able to link this work together so that social service agencies can make those uh, streamlined um, referrals uh, from one agency to the other. Um, as part of this, uh, the two main, uh, uh, from a, from a uh, CIE perspective, the two main uh, uh, pieces that would be pulled together is a, a resource directory infrastructure for the community, um, uh, which is really important if we want to ensure that the work is happening efficiently and uh, accurately uh, in terms of the referrals and that it's, it's streamlined and, and easy to use. Um, uh, and then the second piece would be the uh, referral network infrastructure so that social service agencies can make those referrals uh, and track those referral based outcomes. Uh, so it's not just, uh, I just want to, that's I think the other piece, you know, it's not just about a referral network, which is great, I don't want to, but it's also about uh, providing the opportunity for us to assess the impact of these uh, investments that are happening in the community and um, the impact that it's having on, um, you know, patient uh, or client uh, needs, uh, client experience, uh, you know, all of those different pieces that are critical to uh, success. Uh, the, the third piece we definitely uh, want to phase in, this would very much be a phased approach um, the third piece uh, is, of course, bringing in the healthcare organizations that are engaged and already working in this space and already working with the vendors that are engaged in this, in, in this space. This, is, um, the, the, this uh, would be vendor agnostic in the sense, even from a healthcare organization perspective, folks that are using Unite Us or Aunt Bertha or Signify or Healthify, it, this is not about, okay, now there's one more platform. This is about interoperability so that the, the, through, the, through the CIE, the, these platforms can make those referrals to any and all of the um, community-based uh, uh, organizations that are providing the services. And so uh, that would bring in the healthcare organizations 
in the space uh, and to make those linkage, streamlined linkages happen as well. And then an undercurrent of all of this is, of course, we have to make sure um, that uh, we're thinking about uh, uh, not just adoption, but sustainability model. And that would be from day one, uh, you know, as we're putting this blueprint together of the first meeting of the technology. If you can go to the next slide, Heidi. Um, thank you. So this is just a very rough initial schematic on the right hand side. You actually see uh, the uh, just a very high level blueprint of the CIE and you can, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, you also see the technology vendors who we are, um, who we've been talking to and want to engage in this space because they are the experts in this space and we don't want to reinvent the wheel and create. The idea is to link the work that's, that's already being done by them um, and doing it through this federated model. So, um, uh, so that's the work of the CIE uh, on the right hand side. Uh, and so we have PCIC, we have Wellnity, we, we're, we're talking to uh, the Food Bank, United Way, uh, Combined Arms, um, all of the folks who are, and, and others as, as well, who are already engaged and invested in this space uh, to make, to build on what they're already doing. And that's, I think, the, the important part. And then on the left-hand side, we have all of the work that's happening in the healthcare space and the idea is also then to build on what they're doing, which is if they're using a platform, care coordination platform already like Unite Us or uh, Signify or, or Aunt Bertha, the idea would be to link that uh, into the uh, CIE space. And, and that is important. We want we, that, 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 infra, that ecosystem uh, vision that we have is important because otherwise we will just be creating more um, uh, silos in, in this space uh, if this work is not uh, linked uh, together in a, in a streamlined way. So you can see we en envision the phase one to start on the right hand side in the CIE space and then phase in um, uh, the work uh, on the left hand side. Um, we are the first session of the blueprinting, if you will. Um, you know, we, we, we have the starting point, uh, but um, there's, there's a line between that starting point to the finish, uh, uh, to the end line. And so we want to, that first step is uh, we'll have a blueprinting session of the technology vendors on the social service side. Uh, on September 17th through our data work group um, and uh, just bring together the brain power to see, okay, how, what, is, what are the pieces that we need to have in place? What are the resources that we need to have in place for the organizations that are participating? And what is, this, um, what is the structure of this keeping that end goal of sustainability in, in mind? Um, so, We'll be facilitating that uh, discussion uh, on September 17th. It's, it's, a, it's the data work group, um, the subgroup of that data work group that will be working on, on this. Um, and let me see if there's, um, the, I think the other important piece, which I missed, but it's going to be central to this, is this solution will be built with the community. It, it's for the community, but it's not a top-down approach. Uh, that is like a predetermined solution. Um, it's it will be built with the com community, and that's where all our work groups come in, right? How is this tied to the work of the work groups? Will guide, will provide oversight. Um, the framework uh, that has come out of the frameworks work will uh, guide all of this work. Um, uh, so uh, that's that's going to be the role. Uh, this is one of the various things, right? That we're going we're doing as part of the coalition, um, but the intent is to leverage the work group and the brain power of the work group to help guide this work and and be and community voices is going to be central to that um, effort. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that the intent is of the, when we were you know back ending this into many conversations we've had over the last eighteen months. 
there's desire for the data not to be privatized but democratized through this and that is another piece that's going to be um, uh, some you know part of the conversations that we will have uh, through this uh, so that the intent is for the data to serve the client or the patient. Um, and so we'll be working through all of these pieces, bringing it back to the work groups, to the coalition, um, uh, and it'll be an iterative, very much a phased process uh, as we move uh, forward on this effort. That's all I have, Tenry Heidi. Do you all have anything y'all wanna share? No, I'll just go in and follow up and kind of attach onto what you're saying as a, as a compliment to to the work. Uh, hi, everybody. Morning, everybody. Thank you for, for coming on. Uh, and I see people are still trickling in. So just a real quick reminder, if you haven't already done so, uh, please put your name and uh, your organization in the chat. And there was a question in terms of how you're contributing to the, I guess, the current situation and, and equity. So please, we, we'd love to hear that in the chat. I think it helps uh, everybody, especially people who are new to see who's, who's uh, attending these meetings. Um, and just real quickly, and this is, you know, we talked about this earlier this year and last year, but it, it, it's important because at this time last year, if you remember, uh, many of the organizations who are, who are here uh, were saying we're planning on uh, bringing on a, a, a care coordination vendor or investing in some type of technology. Uh, and again, I'm keeping, I think Sri already explained the difference between the CIE and a care coordination vendor, but, um, but we know now there's been a, a, some time has passed and many organizations are, have gotten much more active in the process. They have put out their RFP, some have even signed contracts. Um, but it's, we just wanted to re-emphasize re and underscore the importance of interoperability. And this kind of, it, you know, some people kind of, kind of keep this in the realm of technology. This is actually uh, uh, an operational and legal uh, necessity. Uh, and especially, you know, it, what it does, and just to first, first and foremost, it doesn't obligate any organization to do anything. It just, for your organization, for all, all the stuff that Sheree had, has already mentioned, uh, if you're talking about the CIE, or even if you're talking about your connection as a healthcare organization, a community-based organization with other organizations, the interoperability is key, because uh, without which it undercuts a lot of, the, a lot of this work. I know everybody who's involved with this has good intentions and wants the best for the community member. Uh, and we want the most seamless care for our community members. That's, I think, first and foremost, our intention. I think we keep that in front of us every time we're making these decisions. Uh, but it allows maximum flexibility and, and power. And the thing is, what we want to emphasize is, uh, this is the feedback we received for these are not my words. Uh, you know, when we were, when the electric, electronic medical records and the EMRs were coming out, the power was in their hands because of the way the contracts were, were made. And we want to, with this, since we're still in the early developmental phase with the care coordination vendors coming out, we want the organizations, whether they're a food bank, whether they're a, a, some other type of nonprofit, or if you're a healthcare institution like a hospital clinic, to be able to make the decisions you want for your community and not be bound to anything else. Uh, so again, if you, so when you're making your contracts with uh, these technology vendors, and we know, and this is, again, uh, we know many of the local technology vendors uh, are very, uh, are, are very uh, community minded. So this is actually, for the most part, not, not referring to them. But in general, uh, the vendors that we have had discussions with, again, really good people, uh, you know, but they have, they have their, their interests that they have to make sure to keep, keep things going. Um, and based upon partners who've shared their experiences with some of these vendors, some vendors may or may not be receptive uh, to actually being inoperable with other organizations if the contract language is not there. If the contract language is there, then it allows your organization at the time you choose to, to then become interoperable with another organization. And that's what's key. It doesn't force you to do it at any point until the time you, you want to do it, but it keeps your, it allows you the flexibility and power to make that decision when it's time for you to do that. Uh, and without that, uh, should I, uh, Heidi, can you go to the next slide? Many of you remember this diagram, this funny diagram from what, from earlier this year, last year, I can't remember when we presented it, but this is the reality. I mean, everybody knows we have silos. I think Dr. Buck or whoever has used the, the, the phrase silos of excellence. Uh, and again, with, with good intentions, there are organizations that are like, well, you know, if they don't include this in there and the vendors are not open to being, not being receptive to being interoperable, you're making decisions and you're making connections with certain organizations uh, but not with everybody. And what you're doing is you're creating, uh, as we mentioned before, much more sophisticated technological silos. 
Uh, and if, if you look across the board, there are all these community resource directories, which is key because I think that's what everybody is also looking at. Each of these community resource directories, if not interoperable, uh, without the infrastructure that had, uh, Srila had mentioned, they each will have varying levels of what types of organizations are in there. And then the patients are then trapped uh, and the organizations are trapped to be able to only use what's in that vendor's community resource directory. So uh, without the infrastructure and the, the ability and the options to keep things open, um, it, it makes things much more difficult for us to be able to be moving forward as a community together. Uh, so again, we want to emphasize uh, if you've already signed contracts, that's fine. See if you can talk to your vendor. If you have not, please, we do emphasize. Uh, interoperability is, is, is key. And I know I'm, it's oversimplification. There's many things that have to be done for that. But at least contract, contractually, putting that in there is, is key. So I'll leave it with that. So and again, throughout, the talk, throughout these discussions, if people have questions, please feel free to answer. If you have comments uh, or if you're saying, Tamri, you're dumb, that's fine. I don't mind that either. So. <laughs> Uh, but just, you know, this is, is a, you know, usually if we're in, in person, people will raise their hands and ask questions. So please feel free to ask questions or, or make comments or push back, please. So, but anyway, with that, that's, that's, that was the main thing. We just wanted to uh, beat that drum a little bit more just to make sure, cause you know, many organizations are at that stage or, or really are, are knee deep in at this point. So thank you. Shall we pause and see if there are any questions from the group right here? on the CIE plans as and or interoperability before we go into the next section. All right, hearing none, um, I'll pass it back to, to you, Tan Weir, um, and we'll move on to the Harris Cares report. Is swim make sure it's able here? Per perhaps shall we go to the work group updates first? Yeah, let's go to the work group updates, and then okay. if Abel is able to attend, then we'll we'll come back to that. Yeah. All right, we're going to start with our newly launched community voice work group. Um, so I will pass the baton to the co-chairs, um, Sean Haley and Misty Mouse Alonsa. Good morning, good morning. It is great to be here. Um, I don't know if Misty is with us uh, this morning, but I'm happy to, uh, she and I have talked regularly and I'm happy to represent her voice this morning. She's magnificent and incredible and we had a great first meeting. So we're really excited. Um, we launched out with an awesome crew of people who had a lot of energy uh, and a lot of excitement. The reason that this slide is up first is because obviously we have a number of different work groups and Community Voice just came on board. And as we were looking at our collective impact model, um, when you look at the cloud and the bubbles there, what you notice is that there are these uh, beautiful white bubbles um, that represent community and community voice. But one of the things you'll notice, and I don't, it's a little blurry, it may be difficult to see or read, but um, in there, thank you, Heidi, in the uh, community partner bubbles, you'll notice that, and this is what is currently represented here. We have nonprofit groups. Um, we have other uh, funders, uh, public agencies. But that very last in the parenthetical information, you'll see resident and uh, where the arrow, thank you, and the cursor currently is. And this is the piece that we're really concerned about and we'll be working on trying to help infuse more um, greatly in the work that we're doing. And what's interesting about it is that, you know, the res we do have, I know, a couple of resident persons who are engaged um, by virtue of perhaps the organizations they work with, et cetera. And so our goal is to really enhance and increase the voice uh, and inclusion of residents. Um, have had conversations around, are there ways to do that even within our work groups? Are there ways that we can ensure that we have that community voice 
you know, at the table through and through. And so while we haven't quite discerned, I think as an organization or a coalition, uh, how to do that, that's gonna be one of the priorities of our thought process. We can move on to the next slide. Um, what happened in our uh, first meeting is essentially what happens in most of the meetings. We had introductions of everybody, um, just fantastic people. We had a great number. Um, I, I wanna say somewhere around 14 to 20, somewhere in there, that's nice loose uh, exchange number, but uh, a nice number of people. And then we looked at that collective impact model that's kind of like setting the tone for making sure that we're gonna include community voice. But really we got into um, reviewing goals and we have two particular goals that we are striving towards. The first one is, um, and I'll use the term loosely because I've seen some very high level landscape scans done, um, but we want to do a landscape scan in air quotes uh, of grassroots community efforts first and foremost, across the coalition itself. So within our coalition, what are people doing um, to garner information and community voice? Who's actually digging deeply in, in that um, realm of work, really connected with community, having um, community uh, residents involved and engaged through and through? What does that work look like? And, and so we want to find out within our coalition, you know, who's got what and how are you doing and also what information and research exists. So from that, we'll do the internal scan, we'll identify then any gaps in information. And of course, the focus right now is on food, we say food security, although I know we're working on food insecurity, we're really trying to flip that on its head and talk about how do we create more food secure communities. And so we want to use internal scan information to identify what uh, information we have available, what are the gaps in information, and then what are additional ways that we can collect and gather inputs from other community voice and other community members. So for example, if we identify that we have a great deal of information, um, folks involved getting community voice uh, with regard to food security, food insecurity issues, and we have everything we need, great. But if we don't and we need to go out and gather additional inputs, um, we may work with the uh, coalitions work group to see what other coalitions exist out in the greater Houston area that we can tap into and garner more information. It might be that we go through super neighborhoods in targeted areas who are already you know, constructed who have great numbers of residents involved uh, from the community and garner more information that way. So that's part of what's gonna happen. And so we started with a uh, committee. Uh, folks began to volunteer to be a part of the goal one, if you will, committee. Then we also had a second goal, which is to really agree on the approach to support informing our coalition here. Um, in terms of community voice. And so what was proposed was to use a design thinking based model and approach to this, which really a lot of folks were excited about that. Um, some of you guys may have done some design thinking work, others may not have, but the approach um, we don't have in here, the particular slide, but the next slide I will tell you, it, it has some of the fundamental aspects and we can go to that um, of design thinking which will give you kind of a general sense. And the key to design thinking is that you're really using, as noted here, an iterative process. It's not necessarily a linear process, but there are particular steps that you find um, throughout design thinking models. And what the beauty of it is, we really want to understand the user. Well, who's the user of the community? Uh, we don't want to do unto the community, right? We want to do with the community. And so one of the things that in all of our um, steadfast work, um, the work um, going on through members of the coalition, some folks I think obviously dig a little more deeply with the community voice side than others when I'm, I'm speaking of members of the coalition now. And so what we really wanna do is make sure that we're embedding that community voice, that that's what a true collective impact model does, right? You don't just 
determine what needs to happen for folks and to folks who really are more inclusive. And so design thinking will really kind of ensure that we're doing that, that we're hearing from the community what the needs are and helping to guide our decision making. Um, and so um, without reading the slide to you, I'm sure you've had plenty of time to, to look at this, but the typical components, you know, begin with empathizing with the community that you're working with, uh, garnering that information, collecting data and information so that you can really truly define the problem. Uh, and from there, you then ideate and move towards innovating innovative thinking around how do we now solve some of those issues um, with the community voice sitting with you at the table in making decisions about solving the issues. And so that ideation just allows you to kind of step outside of whatever box you may be operating within, really um, layering in different thinking. Uh, um, prototype, you know, you then create what it is that you want to try out and you move out with that. But it allows you to be flexible, um, and so the second committee that we have um, is really going to work towards better understanding design thinking as applied to our model and how, how we'll move forward. Um, so I, I think that's the broad overview. You know, typically when you have an initial meeting, a lot of people is some getting to know you, getting to understand the lay of the land. And so we just kind of set forth those two goals and people are really super excited about um, moving forward. Uh, there is not a closed loop. We're happy to have additional folks um, uh, sign up to come on to this particular work group. And uh, we're going to be building out the committees and we're still in the stage of identifying what our regular monthly meeting will be. Um, I may have missed something, you know, when you start talking about these things, you get excited or you, you know, pinpoint one thing that just goes in your head. I've got to emphasize this. So um, I wanted to ask Tim Weir, uh, did I miss anything? or Heidi or Srila that you guys want to make sure that I highlight through this um, because we did talk a little bit more um, about maybe some different items that I may have missed. So I definitely want to open um, the mic up. No, I, I, I thought you, you hit it. You hit all the good, great points. Uh, you hit them all. I also just want to always be honest. I think this is, uh, I think like you had mentioned earlier, uh, this is not necessarily being practiced by everybody. Uh, part of it is because you know, people are not used to sometimes I haven't used having this input this way of going about things and I'll, I'll be honest I think people are going to be uncomfortable having to work through this and I think it's great uh, that we have uh, this work group and, and you and Misty to help uh, and the rest of the work group that's going to help making sure that we're embedding this in, in the processes and the decisions we're making so uh, really excited about this uh, but also understand that uh, you know there's going to be people who are going to be going through the learning process. Uh, and so, yeah, really excited for, for this work group and which I'll be bringing so very much. So thank you, Sean. Yeah, I agree. As, as we build out the community information exchange, building it in a way that um, engages and meets the community members needs is going to be so important. Um, just, just as an example of the next step of our work and how important that is that it's it's grounded in the community voices we develop it. Um, let's go ahead and move to the next work group um, and ask Nadia Siddiqui and Michael Walsh um, to take the floor and give us an update on the frameworks and common metrics. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will go ahead and get us started. I know Michael's on the line as well, and we'll invite him. Uh, to chime in as well. Um, but we've been fast and furious working through um, really to uh, establish a social determinants of health framework that would serve as really the underlying and underpinning of all the work that we do um, as part of the coalition's efforts. And so early on in the year, we conducted a systemic review, a systematic review of global and national SDOH frameworks. Um, we evaluated several from the World Health Organization to those that other states were employing to others um, that are more tightly focused around food insecurity, um, weighing their relevance and their application to the coalition's efforts. And through that process really landed on the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative um, framework, so the Bar High framework. 
um, for several reasons. We, and, and really piggybacking on, on what Sean talked about, to us it was very important to ensure that the framework we select has a strong community underpinning, that we aren't just focused around you know, our mid-determinants, but really um, ensuring that um, whatever we do intends to not only shift systems in the midstream, but really moving upstream to addressing systemic racism, to addressing um, you know, just those structures and systems that are driving um, opportunities and living conditions and so forth. And so um, we've got a draft version that we've developed um, that our work group has really been um, critical to informing, guiding, and ensuring that the framework is reflective, um, not only of the coalition's mission, but reflective of um, each entity's um, work as, as far as the work group goes. Um, it is currently now being reviewed um, at the steering committee level. Uh, once it's received kind of that final approval and go ahead, um, it's gone through uh, graphic design. Um, we look forward to sharing it with this wider and broader uh, coalition group. Um, so our next steps from here really are to, to finalize, refine the framework, and use it as a launching point to move into the development of common metrics for the coalition and the proof of concept that Dr. Sherma shared uh, earlier on. And so this framework will not only um, and, and really guide the direction and work of the coalition, but it's going to also help us um, hold ourselves accountable. And so the metrics are going to be very closely tied to the mission vision of the coalition, but also to the framework. And that's currently the process that we're in, um, you know, recognizing uh, how busy schedules are, the way we've gone about this is really engaging a small subset of organizations that are really very actively engaged, invested, who've been just phenomenal to contributing their ideas um, and, and um, input. And so um, we look forward to uh, really sharing and unveiling both the framework and, and a draft set of common metrics when we all reconvene. Um, again, but I'd like to open it up to Michael and see um, if he'd like to add anything I may have missed. Great comments, Nadia. Um, great, good overview. Just only quick uh, additions are that, just again, credit to the work group. Um, we applied a, a great sense of urgency around this work from the very outset. We knew how critical it was to determine uh, what frame we would view the um, work of the coalition from and how we would assure that we could distinguish specifically the work of the coalition from the work of any one individual group. And so as Nadia articulated very nicely, um, the one of the key parts of the framework that's forthcoming is the ability for each organization to find and identify um, where their work sits uh, within the framework, as well as for us as an overall coalition to determine where we may be missing stakeholders, where are the folks that are not at the table that need to be there to assure that we are fully covered across the impact continuum. Um, the, um, the, the, the last thing is I think that we, we also wanna have this framework be a way to apply urgency going forward. These issues that are facing our community are issues that are not, that are systemic, that are also not, not going away anytime soon. So the, the need for us to not be an academic exercise, but for us to be an exercise that actually is applied and measured in real time um, is really, I think, really a strong foundation for this work group and just grateful for what has now been six months of effort gone into the work that we shared this morning. This is Srila. I just want to say thank you to the framework. I mean, all the work groups, uh, uh, but also to Nadia, Michael for leading uh, this effort for the frameworks and common metrics, because I think, um, as you said, you guys said, this is really going to anchor the work for the coalition moving forward, but also this is a framework that is, uh, we want coalition member organizations and um, uh, to, to, to look at and um, think about how this might apply to the work that uh, they're doing in regards to the coalition as well. So I think there's, it's bi-directional. Um, uh, so uh, I really appreciate it. I, I really like it. Do we have a fi fi the figure of the coalition, of the framework uh, in the slide deck? If not, <laughs> Not okay. yet, not yet. We'll okay. put, ha, we'll have to plan a big unveiling of it. Um, 
once it's final for the next um, December meeting of the coalition. Okay, but is it, I thought it's in the progress report, no? Mm, potentially, I can't remember. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I thought I remembered seeing it in the, but anyway, it's, I, I, I really, uh, I'm, I'm excited that we have the work, uh, this work to anchor everything else that we'll do. Yes, thank you. All right, well, let's move to the next work group. Keep us on schedule here. We've got the data sharing ecosystem work group. I see you, MJ, do you want to take it away? And, and if your co-chairs want to chime in as well. Sure, good morning, everyone. So for the data sharing group, um, our major progress are, first of all, we uh, finalized RP language for the interoperability rules that largely take reference from the CI, uh, CMS regulation released earlier this spring. And then we circulate among the subgroup and collect some feedback from Humana and other, among other partners. And I believe the language are being finalized right now. And Second point is, as um, Srila mentioned a little bit um, earlier at the beginning of this meeting, where a few uh, vendors or partners are going to get together to discuss about the nitty gritty of how to implement the CIS in the tech space. And then last but not least, we, uh, in our last month's meeting, we uh, try to collect the full standard that being used among different partners try to find out what are the common metrics to be shared in uh, across the coalition. And that part is being led by uh, Srila. So I don't know if Srila wants to chime in and adding any update about the food standard uh, common metrics, but these are, these are the main major progress uh, from this group. We did send a survey out uh, regarding uh, to capture this information. And um, uh, uh, I, I think many of you did receive, well, the coalition members did receive the survey. Um, we will, if we haven't done that already, uh, we will resend it to the organizations that haven't completed it. Uh, but please go ahead and complete the, the information on the survey. It's very short if you're not doing anything on food insecurity. You have one question to answer. <laughs> but uh, if not, uh, we just want to capture uh, so what and, and identify what are the common denominators when it comes to um, the work around food security in our community. And so, um, yes. Yeah. Um, and we have preliminary results that in the food security work group, but these two work groups collaborated on, on the survey. So, so a little bit more to come here in just a moment. Also, I just wanna add uh, the, the language that, was, uh, that MJ referred to, uh, that's been shared by email and it's on the Monday Network site as well. If you've not received the interoperability guidance language, feel free to contact us and we can send it as well. Uh, there, there's actually going to be a couple of additional additions to that, but for the most part, it, it's uh, mostly complete. So, thank you, thank you, Ruth and Nancy. Do you guys want to give a quick update? Yes, happy to. Um, this is Ruth. Um, we are the Coalition's Alignment Workgroup, and we have been working um, on a survey that we plan to send out to other coalitions. So first we uh, collected all the different coalitions in the area that were working um, in really any social determinant of health um, and identified contact information for those folks. And I think we have just about everyone now, uh, big thanks to our working group overall for helping us to identify those individuals, that list. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big list of groups. Most of them are captured in the Mighty Networks uh, group as well. Um, and then we've been working on the survey. We're not quite done with it yet. We wanted to align the questions with the, um, with the framework that you just heard about. Um, so we're gonna add a couple questions there. We're also going to meet with the community voice group to see how we might align some of our questions to address some of their questions as well. So we don't send everybody 100 different surveys. Um, so we're looking at some of those things, um, but we do have a digital version of it, thanks to Nancy and her team at Texas Children's. Um, so we're, we're very close and ready to go as soon as we feel like it's a final place to go. Um, and then we also worked with the communications working group to develop an email that we can explain what this group is, um, what this survey is and how we hope to use the information in the future. Um, and then we will post all the information. It's a 
pretty short survey since we wanted people to actually take it. Um, so it's, you know, name, contact information, and a little bit about who the coalition targets and what kind of work they do. So that is where we are right now. Um, and as soon as we think it's a good time to send it out, we will send it out and then we'll reconvene our group and keep going. Thank you so much, Ruth. All right, moving along to the uh, policy work group, Stacy, Tim. Good morning, everyone. So the Social Determinants of Health Policy Work Group um, is really focused on advancing policies that actualize equity and foster greater community resilience. And so we wanted to target policies that um, impact minoritized and marginalized communities who've historically experienced inequities and, and social injustice, such as racism and economic oppression. And so we, to that end, we kind of developed established two goals. Um, the first is to conduct a landscape analysis to assess um, some of the current policy opportunities related to social determinants. Um, and in the first phase, we kind of broke it out into two phases. The first phase was to really look at the food assistance policies that promote food security. Um, we completed that. We looked at policies pre and post COVID-19. Um, and we're now working to look at policies that indirectly impact food insecurity, um, such as affordable and sustainable housing, education and workforce development, employment income, and access to health. And uh, we really wanted to identify um, in our landscape analysis, ensure that we identify actions that can have or policies that produce a measurable impact and um, can demonstrate success as it relates to advancing equity. And we also wanted um, to identify policies that challenge existing systems, um, policies and practices that were not working or perpetuating inequities. So the ultimate, the second goal is to um, provide a final set of policies to support the work of the um, coalition. Thank Are there you, any Stacey. questions? Sure. And, yes, and again, for those who are interested, uh, as we continue on, if you're interested in these work groups as you're hearing things, maybe sometimes for the first time, reach out to the, uh, you know, the co-chairs who are, you know, you see them here as they're presenting or reach out to us or anybody. And the work groups are open. It's, it's an open door uh, policy. So please feel free to, to join. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll pass it to Nikki and Hope. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on the goals, Heidi, if we can just go ahead and um, go to the next slide. Um, I'll remind everybody what we're addressing with each intervention. So um, just a quick update. Uh, one of our goals is to um, link to Houston Food Systems to collaborate and determine about um, some shared strategies. We had a meeting with Libby, um, and we are waiting on some updates for the next executive meeting um, to identify opportunities and increase alignment. Um, we had uh, an email back in August, and that executive meeting was, um, I think they, they didn't have it, so the conversation was tabled. So we are waiting on that. Um, but the first meeting was really, really great, so uh, more to come there. The next goal is related to conducting a landscape of um, food security interventions um, in our community. And I just want to echo what Sean and Nadia said earlier, that we're really interested in the, what the community um, is doing. And by community, we mean our consumers as well as our um, uh, community-based organizations. Um, that said, we did send out a survey um, in August, and we've had some responses. Um, we did meet with Dr. Sharma and Tenweer and Heidi and everyone, and we went and kind of looked at the data. However, um, like every other survey, when, you've, when you ask questions, there's more questions to be asked. Um, so we are going to also get, so we're gonna do a deeper dive on that. Um, we're gonna gather um, some additional responses because there are some partners that 
um, were not represented in the survey. So I will say and also support what Dr. Sharma said earlier is that if you didn't, you know, have time to do our surveys, so please, please just, you know, take a few minutes to do that. Um, as far as the preliminary data from that survey, I'm going to let Jenny, um, Nikki and I uh, would like for Jenny to, to actually talk about this. Jenny Gonzalez is our population health analyst who, who spent some time on this. So Jenny, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so as Hope mentioned, um, we received 63 responses for the survey. Um, so when we broke it down um, based on which organizations were represented, only 35 of the organizations um, from the coalition are represented in this data. Um, so just really quickly to kind of go over what, what we have right now, um, what we saw was that 32 of the 57 respondents said that they're currently screening for food insecurity. Um, of the remaining 25 respondents that are not screening, only two um, mentioned that they will start screening for food insecurity within the next year. Um, on the next point, um, we asked what tools are being used to screen for food insecurity, and the majority of respondents mentioned that they're using the two-item hunger vital signs questionnaire. Um, some of the other tools that were being used were the prepare assessment tool, um, the CMS Accountable Health Community Screening Tool, and um, others did not really specify or they mentioned that it really depends on what partners they're working with and, and that kind of thing. Um, in regards to how the screenings are being done, um, as in, is the organization screening through like an electronic tool or using like a paper-based method? There is a lot of variety on how that's being done and a lot of combinations of, you know, um, depending on the department, they screen using an electronic method or it's self-reported by a patient or a client. Um, sometimes it's done over the phone. So there wasn't really like, at least right now with the preliminary data, a majority um, type of way that it's, that it's being done. Um, Regarding where screening is being conducted within organizations, 58% um, of the respondents mentioned that it's being done in a partial setting. So some organizations mentioned that it's only in outpatient settings, only in pediatric settings, um, only done when um, working with mental health uh, patients. Um, and then around 30%, so maybe eight of the respondents mentioned um, that they were screening system wide. So that's kind of what, what we saw. And a, and a couple of organizations didn't really know um, how, how screening was being done in terms of departments or across the organization entirely. Um, as far as how many of the patients or clients are being screened within organizations, um, around 50% of respondents are screening 50% to 100% of the clients or, or, um, or patients. 30% um, were screening between zero and 25%. Um, so that was pretty good that, you know, half of them are screening, you know, half or more of, of the clients or patients in the organization. Um, for, um, Screening frequency, seven of 18 respondents said that they're screening at every visit. Um, three respondents mentioned that they're screening quarterly and one mentioned that they were screening every six months. Um, for a lot of the other uh, respondents that, that didn't specify with the options that were offered, they mentioned that screening frequency kind of varies depending on the department depending on the need of the patient. So sometimes if a patient has expressed food insecurity in the past, they'll screen again, or the frequency changes on the first response, based on the first response, sorry. Um, and some mentioned that it also just depends on, on the reason that they're coming in um, to receive care. Um, in terms of how information is being documented, um, we got information from 22 respondents for these type of questions. So 20 of 22 are documenting using an electronic database. Um, we got additional information from 17, 17 respondents 
um, and all of them are documenting at an individual level. Um, 12 of these 17 are using an EMR um, to document, and the remaining five are using um, systems like Salesforce, um, tools like Excel. Um, some have like their own software within the organization. Um, so that's kind of what we saw there right now. And um, lastly, six of 15 respondents mentioned that they're using care coordination platforms at this time. Um, one was using Healthify, two mentioned Aunt Bertha, um, one mentioned that they're transitioning to PCIC this fall. Um, some also mentioned that they have their own platform within the organization. And of the nine organizations that said they're not using an, a platform right now, three of them are planning on using one within the next 12 months. Um, so that's kind of what we have right now as preliminary data. Um, as Hope and Dr. Sharma mentioned, you know, if, if you um, haven't had a chance to respond, um, I'm not sure if the, if the survey has gone out again, but please take some time so we can kind of, you know, get a bigger picture and, and better representation of the organizations. Thank you, Jenny. Really appreciate that. I think this is going to be really valuable to have an understanding of what are the workflows and, and building from that recommendations to support organizations at, at, as they grow the impact of their work in screening and responding to food insecurity. All right. Let's go ahead and move to the next work group. Uh, communications, Alicia and Melissa, you're up. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Melissa Dano, and you know, Alicia and I are the co-chairs um, of the communications work group. Um, I really love hearing from all the other work groups. This meeting has been awesome so far. Super excited. I feel like we're poking holes in those little silos, right? We're getting multi grains here, guys, not just one grain. <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, so what we've been up to mainly is uh, developing right, our brand and digital presence. Um, so, you know, we've been speaking to a few marketing firms. Um, today is the last day, um, really, for input from the group. So um, uh, Alicia had mentioned she's going to put in the um, a link to the branding rubric for anybody who wants to take a look at it. You know, we want it to be a very open process um, so that y'all can see, you know, we've been talking to um, Versa and Gilbreth where um, the main firms um, that we've been um, chatting with um, and the rubric includes, you know, different categories? Is it, you know, a minority or woman-owned business? What does the timeline look like for what they can produce? You know, as y'all are asking questions, I had mentioned the Mighty Networks platform. Um, right now, that's what we're using. For any of you who haven't heard of it, um, if you just Google Mighty Networks, or you can also look for the app um, on your local app store, um, and then you can log in either with LinkedIn, or you can create, you know, kind of your own thing. Um, and then just search for um, Greater Houston Coalition on SDOH and pop right up um, after Greater Houston, and then you can kind of find us there. Um, if anybody needs any help navigating anything or is like, I can't find stuff, you know, let me know, tap me on the shoulder. It's, you can do it. We're all professionals. I know we're a little bit maybe, um, uh, app tired <laughs> but you know that's part of the reason why we're engaging with these firms right we don't just kind of want to um slap any old website out on there um and and it not function the the purpose that we needed to serve right and that serve the first the purpose that we needed to serve um so that's why we've been um talking to these firms and having really great conversations about what our needs are so that we can more easily engage with each other and also have a you know uh, another public facing um you know platform to showcase all the awesome things that we're doing right um so i highly encourage y'all to take a look at it to hit us up if you will and um you know to take a look at that branding rubric 
Um, the, the more input that we get from y'all, the better. Um, part of the reason why diversity is so important is because you'll see things that I don't see. Um, I see things that you may not see, so we definitely, you know, encourage um, any kind of input that you, you want to put um, forth. Uh, that being said, um, we've also, you know, we've also been uh, talking a bit with the other work groups. Um, if your work group has a need, we do have um, kind of a spreadsheet with some questions. Um, so you can kind of just tap in there and click on that link. Um, if there's some, some kind of communication need that you may have or some kind of input that you want to put in. Um, you know, the other thing as we talk to other work groups and engage with each other, we're kind of seeing what our needs are and we want to be able to bring those needs to the um, branding and marketing people um, so that they can assist us with that. Um, also, number three, social butterflies or social, you know, people who are right, who's, who's been locked away? Anyone? Anyone? Show of hands. Okay. So here's an opportunity <laughs> for us not just to, you know, talk at you, even though the chat looks like it's booming a little bit, which is great. Um, but it's a chance for us to kind of, you know, in a less formal way, engage with each other. Um, some of our, our other communication members have been great at, you know, at coming up with ideas. I don't want to talk about it too much. I'm going to just love a little teaser. There will be themes. There will be opportunities. There will be breakout rooms, okay? So um, look out for an invite. We'll also post it on the Mighty Networks as well. Um, and, you know, down there, I, I just put a little bit of information again. If you want to specifically contact anyone in the communications work group or in any of the work groups, you, know, you just go to the Mighty Networks, you go to the work groups tab, and um, we put lots of our posts and slides and links um, up there. There's a lot of great articles in there. It's a really good way to kind of get to know who is in the coalition, you know, what do y'all do? That's one way to engage um, is through that Mighty Networks platform. And then also we are going to have that um, the network networking meeting um, coming up soon. So that's all I have. Alicia, would you like to add anything? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to share updates. Um, the only thing I wanted to touch base on um, is the branding and digital presence. So the, in the rubric we sent over, um, you know, we started with four firms. We didn't hear back from one. Um, and then we narrowed it down to the three. Um, principal had to back out because of a bandwidth issue. So we're now down to two, um, Gilbreth and Versa Creative. I believe, um, you know, we're all leaning towards Versa a creative uh, mainly because of their experience working with complex concepts such as the coalition. Um, if you scroll over on the rubric, you'll see uh, we're in the column where it talks about examples of their work. They have a there's a really great link um, to their, one of their slide decks that they shared with us. Um, I think it's slide 19. You can see uh, one specific example um, of work they did with the Cardiovascular Association and just helping them rebrand. Very modern and creative twist to um, so this more traditional concept. And so um, there was that. They're also very catchy, catchy innovative, and um, lively. Those are a few things we are looking for in the branding space. Um, and then also uh, ability to, um, you know, the, the language, working with multiple language vendors, you know, being in the most diverse city in the country, that was extremely important as well. Um, I believe we found out, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Heidi and Melissa, but um, or, or excuse me, Gilbreth had only worked with Spanish speaking, whereas Versa, you know, they're working with four to five language vendors on a regular basis. So that was a, a, another um, selling point. So if you have any feedback, please share with us by the day to day. Uh, so we can get the ball rolling on this and move forward with um, getting our, our digital and branding completed. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, Alicia and, and Melissa. We'll move to the last of the work group updates. So this is our last work group that's going to be coming online and it's really with executive leaders to, to promote 
um, the work that we're doing. We're talking about big, complex societal systems changes here, um, and we need leaders across our community to help support and build out engagement in that. So more to come on this this fall, but we just wanted to r remind everybody that this is in the wings. And with that, let's go back to Abel Chaco and the Harris Cares Report um, and hear more about um, this really important report and set of recommendations for our community and how that connects to the coalition's efforts. And just real quick, I'm just uh, before Abel starts. So for people who are not as familiar with Abel, he works with uh, uh, Stacey Nine, the Office of Policy and Planning at Harris County Public Health. Uh, he's actually one of the primary co-authors of the Harris Cares Report as well. Uh, and during this COVID response has been very instrumental. Actually, the reason why he was not here early, he was on a call with the county judge's office. So he wasn't sleeping like I suspected, but he was actually on an important call. So anyway, with that, Abel, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank, thanks, Senator, for the nice nice words. And, and I already got a few messages, messages saying, you know, great dramatic entrance. So uh, sorry for being late, and thank you, Heidi and Tenor and, and Sheila, for for being accommodating. Um, just uh, very quickly, uh, kind of moving along the, the presentation, um, Harris Cares is uh, a report that was produced um, by Harris County Public Health um, in 2019 at the request of uh, Commissioner's Court, which is the county uh, governing body. Um, and we had a few um, folks who were even on this call that I just want to make sure that I recognize Dr. Nowski, um, Penny, um, and others who I think are on this call, um, who were uh, major primary authors for this and, and did a lot of um, data analysis work for uh, this report. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was really a uh, department-wide um, effort. And so the report, um, uh, just very uh, quickly, Harris County Public Health really prides itself on innovation, equity, and engagement as our cornerstone values. Um, uh, just recently, we've launched our data warehouse, which is a major innovation for um, data visualization capacity for the public health department that we really want to um, share and spread throughout the community. Um, and and uh, for COVID response, um, just recently re released a equitable testing strategy plan um, for the county to talk about um, equity in terms of access and the opportunity for access to uh, COVID-19 testing. Uh, can we move to the next slide, Heidi? Um, and so Harris Cares, um, as the report just, just mentioned before, really was to assess um, a couple different things. One was uh, the system readiness for healthcare and public health across the county. Um, two, what are differences in health across the lifespan? And then three, take those data points and the findings of that analysis and really make concrete local policy recommendations um, for um, the county and city. And so that I think is where this report um, goes beyond the traditional kind of community health assessment and um, uh, other types of population health indicator reports to say we were trying to provide massive transformational um, recommendations um, along the span of 10 years um, for the county and city. And we'll get into those, those T-Rex in a minute. And, and so, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the report is really an extensive um, uh, collection of primary and secondary data analysis. One of our key data sets that we're using thanks to UTSPH was the Health of Houston survey um, uh, in 2018 data. Um, we did an extensive literature review. We used state and CDC data um, to produce basically um, 150 maps and figures that were done at the census tract or Puma level that I'll, I'll um, provide some examples of. But at the, on the primary side, we really looked at um, uh, we interviewed over 100 executives in healthcare, academic, nonprofit sectors to really get their thoughts on one, where are we um, with systems change in the county and, and where could we be? Um, so the report goes into three different areas. Um, the next, next slide, please. Um, is uh, transforming health, really thinking about um, public health and healthcare, where do the intersections lie? 
building resilience, um, what does it mean to assess the county where we live, learn, work, worship, and play, and then a snapshot of health, um, providing population health indicators to support all of that work in transforming health and, and building resilience. Um, next slide, please. So transforming health, um, I, I'm gonna flash, I don't know how many people can see my video, but, but the book it's, itself is, is split into three different sections. That transforming health um, offers a couple different chapters. Um, public health and healthcare is really where we um, talk about the intersections of both of those uh, categories and then, and then we, go into healthcare access and delivery, um, insurance rate coverage, um, number of folks who are reporting um, delayed care um, due to um, uh, you know, either access to insurance or transportation, et cetera, et cetera. We really make the case and offer the data points for that. And then we get into the business case for transforming health. What does it mean to take those indicators and say, you know, if we invest in public health, this is the return on investment for um, um, health. And we looked in there um, very specifically, um, uh, preventable hospitalizations, that's defined by um, the area AHRQ, and I forget what AHRQ stands for, um, but we looked into preventable hospitalizations across the county and said for diabetes, dehydration, um, uh, Chronic, or, or, or cardiovascular disease, a lot of these um, hospitalizations are preventable. And if we invested in, in public health, um, we would be able to uh, prevent. And I got a message, it's Agency for Healthcare Quality and Reform. Uh, and then Voices Heard for, by ACPH really gets into community voice and stakeholder voices about each of these things. And those transformational recommendations I'll get into in a second. Um, next slide, please. Building resilience really gets into the fact that we can't even talk about transforming health until we talk about health happening where we live, learn, work, worship, and play. Um, and so equitable communities live in environments that ensure the community's easiest choice is the healthiest choice. Um, and we know that there is never a dull moment in Harris County. Um, uh, hurricanes, uh, pandemics, um, Zika, fires, all of that requires an intense look at resiliency, um, the, the ability of a community to not only withstand shocks to the system, but also thrive. And, and mental health is really a key component of all of that. Um, next slide, please. And then we go into a snapshot of health. And what we did was offer a um, comprehensive um, look at data indicators around chronic disease, injury, family health and infectious disease. Because um, when, we, when we talk about collective impact projects, when we talk about um, the major work that coalitions need to do, uh, it's, it's very important that all of us have a good understanding of a specific population health indicator, like the rate of diabetes, like the rate of juvenile diabetes, and say, this is what we want to target and this is what we want to bring down. Um, next slide, please. So I want to walk you through um, some of the findings and some of the um, maps and graphs that you can find in the report. Um, so life expectancy, um, this is not new, but maybe newly visualized, is life expectancy differs by up to 24 years across Harris County. Um, so uh, the greatest life, ex at the Puma level, the highest life expectancy is around the Memorial Bear Creek area. The lowest life expectancy is around East Little York, Sedegas. Um, and the data from CDC maps out these census tracts by life expectancy. Um, and this was a key component of our report and it really built up a lot of um, major political action to say this is unacceptable for Harris County. And we looked at um, life expectancy ranges across the state. Harris County had the largest range in life expectancy when compared to the other 254 counties in Texas. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also looked at insurance coverage and, and delay in, in accessing care. And this is one of those ones where I wanted to, to demonstrate the layering effect of the data analysis that we did. You know, one, we looked at, okay, across Harris County, um, how many folks are without health insurance? And then we overlaid uh, 
actual FQHCs and community health clinics that we know of um, and overlay that with um, the, the uh, uh, health insurance to see, you know, where could there be um, FQHCs, where is there clusters of FQHCs and how can we think about realistic co-locations, expansions and, and investment into community health clinics. And then we overlay that with saying, okay, well, and let's talk about this health insurance. Let's talk about these community health clinics and what um, areas and what neighborhoods are really reporting delaying seeing a uh, doctor or care um, um, to really target and focus um, place-based interventions across the county. Uh, next slide. So uh, uh, talked about this a little bit earlier, but preventable hospitalizations could have been prevented by effective primary and outpatient services. And when we looked and when we, when we really looked at this data, we saw that 10 hospitals saw roughly 50% of all preventable hospitalizations. And that out, is out of, I think, over 180 hospitals in the, the county. Um, and so really we can start looking at specific neighborhoods, specific zip codes, and saying these are the neighborhoods that where we see the highest rates of preventable hospitalizations, and they're going to these specific hospitals. And that's really going to inform the way in which our health departments um, engage the healthcare sector. Next slide. So uh, I'm going to walk through very quickly um, some of the transformational recommendations that we offered in the report. And one was to really say that we need to drive systems change and in public health and healthcare and invest in, um, uh, yeah, and I should also thank, I just saw Neuron um, pop up on the board. Jamie Revisors, thank you so much for a lot of these visualizations, huge, huge help. Um, and so um, uh, one was driving systems change in, in public health and, and healthcare. Um, really, when we think about uh, the work needed to do this, Public health needs to act as, public health departments need to act as the community health, uh, community's chief health strategist. And so what does it mean to convene partners? What does it mean to share projects? What does it mean to really move forward the work of coalitions to address upstream health issues? Um, and so infrastructure projects, um, countywide health initiatives, expanding on the work of complete communities in the city for the county, um, I think is some of the ways in which we want to move um, in terms of the way we think about um, projects and services that are delivered by our health departments and really thinking about projects and um, collaborations that are systems wide. Um, next slide. Um, two was enhance and develop health infrastructure. So we found huge rates and um, disproportionate um, impacts to access to care. And a lot of that has to do with health infrastructure, not just brick and mortar, um, but also around telehealth. And, um, you know, one of the things we wanted to build on the, um, uh, uh, there's a mental health report that was released in, in 2017, um, really expanding on the co-location of uh, mental and primary care services um, for community health clinics, um, and then um, uh, access to specialty care alongside mental health, but also dialysis. These other things that we know are important, especially during um, emergencies. Um, and I want to highlight before we move on really quickly, sorry, that last, um, I love this quote from um, Peggy Smith with, with Baylor Teen Clinic, as a community that has the best medical care in the world, we need to translate that to all communities that need the most um, care. Um, next slide. The, the next one is really around enhancing the safety net for un and underinsured residents. So we looked at health insurance um, rates and, and we know that um, Harris County specifically is known as um, huge rates of uninsurance across the county. And we looked actually at um, socio-demographic groups like um, age groups and um, racial and ethnic categories. And we know that of Black and Hispanic communities, um, huge rates of uninsurance. And so we really want to talk about, okay, well, what does it mean to um, continue advocating for expanding Medicaid and exploring um, um, pushes for 1115s and other waivers like 1332? And then what does it mean for Harris County to explore new healthcare delivery models and developing a um, model similar to New York, San Diego, California, um, to 
create a Harris Care model and expanding the impacts of um, the gold card for the county and expanding financial assistance. And then um, you can't talk about any of these um, um, financial uh, delivery model um, uh, reforms without talking about, we really need to also talk about um, an awareness campaign for public charge and other barriers to care that impact even accessing those um, um, insurance and safety net measures. Um, next slide. Um, the next thing gets into, four and five uh, really get into program and quality improvement and efficiency is around the county um, and health care systems across the, the, um, the, the county. One is to um, you know, really review the existing grants, program services that local government has to offer in the health and social service world. Um, and then two, what does it mean to improve data sharing for a countywide health initiative? Key example of this is community information exchange um, and, and really expanding on health information exchanges, et cetera. Um, those are the kinds of things that are necessary for us to even begin true work on a countywide health initiative um, that we talk about in that T Rack one. Um, uh, encouraging joint community health assessments and plans for, for um, one, the four county agencies. So there's, there are four county agencies that really focus on health. Harris County Public Health, Houston Health Department, um, our two health departments for the region. Harris Health, our, our hospital system for the county. And then four, uh, Harris Center, which is our mental health authority for the county. And actually really even five, our community services department, which offers human services and social services for the, the county. And so really thinking about the way in which all of us are collecting data that talk about population health indicators and, and doing that on a more regular basis with each other to then take out whatever we need to for our strategic plans and for our um, uh, required initiatives. Um, and then the next slide, um, gets into very specifically Harris County and the city of Houston. So one of the slides earlier um, for Harris County Public Health, and I should have said this earlier, Harris County Public Health is one of two health departments. We service the county outside the city of Houston limits. Um, and city of Houston Health Department offers um, uh, same and similar services for um, within city of Houston. And really we wanted to talk about, okay, well, what does it mean for Harris County and the city of Houston to review and identify overlapping health services and really offer ways in which we can streamline those services. COVID-19 pandemic is a great example of that. We've really expanded the way in which the city and Harris County um, offer and present unified data um, uh, would point you all towards um, the COVID-19 dashboard, which, which offers um, a comprehensive look at uh, COVID-19 um, both within the city of Houston and across Harris County so that all of us can really make um, targeted interventions and we're able to improve uh, systems interoperability and really improving those data sharing uh, needs across um, the city county as well as um, joint strategies and processes um, that align across the county. Um, so that really is, is the overview of um, the report, and obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic, and this, we can go to the, to the last slide for, for questions, but I just want to make sure I make this note. Um, you know, as we um, get into um, and, and continue into the nine-month response of COVID-19, um, you know, one, huge impacts to access to care that we really need to um, address moving forward. And even the recommendations and the data analysis that we, we look at here um, uh, are, are truly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. But then two, it really offers an intense look at public health and healthcare that um, we have never had before. And so utilizing the COVID-19 pandemic um, and thinking about the way in which we have a long-term response to COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, will, I think, move forward some of these recommendations to and, and really have increased political buy-in, community um, uh, programs buy-in for um, a comprehensive look at our, our public health and healthcare system. So I'm very excited about the next five, 10 years 
uh, for public health in Harris County, because uh, I think there's a lot of intense um, look and a lot of um, uh, intense uh, uh, opportunity um, to move forward um, these recommendations. So that was it. That was Harris Cares. Um, there's a copy of, of Harris Cares that's available online through our website. Definitely would um, navigate you all there. We're going to be releasing pretty soon some one pagers on each of these chapters to really take, you know, what is 300 pages of data and just um, really hone it down on what are our policy recommendations for each of these um, specific areas um, for you all to utilize as a, as a resource in collective planning. That's really the goal of this report is, is a resource, um, something to turn back to. I've turned back to it several times, even during this response, to say, oh yeah, 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 insurance coverage is this in this area. That's why we need to focus on this community. Um, so um, very proud of this report, very proud and, and thankful for many people on this um, call who have contributed to the support um, and think it'll be a great um, asset to our community and our, our projects moving forward. Um, so that was it. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Tanmir, for, for um, uh, inviting us on the call. Thank, thank you, Abel. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to share an overview of this report and definitely agree it's quite the resource for our community and, and roadmap for how we work together and, and, and support y'all in your, in your efforts. Um, Tanmir, did you have anything you wanted to chime in and then we can maybe open it up for questions? Yeah, that's what I just wanted to make sure to see if there are any bad questions specifically since we're with Able, but obviously they can carry over to later. Any any questions, anyone? I guess I have, this is Srila. Thanks, uh, Abel, for your presentation. I have a question. Um, since, can you talk a little bit about how the report aligns with the work of the coalition. I know it's sort of stating the obvious, but from your yeah. end, I think it would be good for the group to hear kind of where you see the intersection points are. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, so I'll say um, uh, Harris Cares was really um, uh, two things. One, to really refocus and think about our own department and what we are um, focusing our efforts on. And then two, um, you know, based on these population health indicator recommendations to the community at large, um, and specifically health, public health, social service um, stakeholders within the region. And I think um, TREC 1 really gets at the work of the coalition that the greatest, which is in order to address any of those population health indicators that we were talking about in the snapshot of health, you really have to think about how are we aligning our um, coalitions, um, our um, major collective impact projects um, throughout the, the region to um, uh, support and tackle very specific population health indicators. And so what we really wanna do at the county level is to make the case um, for a countywide health initiative and make the case for supporting and pushing forward the work of coalitions like the Social Determinants of Health Coalition, but also you know, groups like the Bridge Up Project at uh, Manager Health Clinic, right? Having those kinds of projects really supported and um, uh, championed um, by the, um, the county stakeholders um, to really um, address some of these population health indicators. And then very specific to the community information exchange, um, I think that is one of the types of, uh, well, see, um, even the indicators that we talked about in this report are, are lagged indicators. It's, it's data that we're getting from the state um, that is sometimes a year, two years behind. Um, and so having, you know, and I've worked with, with projects all the time, the first thing that anyone ever talks about before we create any project is, all right, well, how are we going to share data across our, our organizations? And um, it, it comes back almost always to this idea of for anyone providing services, for anyone providing um, um, uh, wraparound services as part of their collective impact project data sharing and 
sharing of these community um, uh, uh, social service records is key and almost always the first barrier. And so addressing that is one of the first things when we talk about systems interoperability and data sharing for a countywide health initiative. That's the kind of project that we want to really figure out if we can one align county resources towards, uh, but then two, um, um, developing a space and making sure and ensuring that there's a space for those investments and for that collaboration to happen. And that I think is where we're pushing our public health staff really towards, which is what does it mean for our public health staff to really support the work of um, our community partners instead of thinking that we can tackle it alone. Yeah, great. Uh, sorry, I just got a question from Sean Haley. Um, any sense of how the recommendations may impact the county's use of space like the, the Riverside Hospital? Um, I don't know if, if um, others are on the line to, to address Riverside Hospital specifically, but one of the recommendations that we do make in this report is to um, really expand on hospital feasibility studies for the county. We looked at um, uh, trauma service regions um, that were within a 15 minute drive time um, to a local hospital, as well as um, an overlay of all local hospitals within the region um, with uh, health insurance and population density and social vulnerability. One of the things that we really um, um, uh, pushed on is, is two things. One is um, the county is rapidly expanding in certain areas. We really need to take that into account when we're talking about building new hospitals. And then two, there is an overlay um, an existing social vulnerability for several of our communities. And so um, um, we do speak to the fact that um, hospital infrastructure, there is a need for increased hospital infrastructure um, for the, the county. And, and the question from, from John, this is the same one that came out last year. Uh, just couldn't talk about it for a while because of COVID. <laughs> Great questions. Any other questions from the group? I don't think I'll, I'm just, I'll just add real quick. Um, you know, if you look about a year ago uh, at you know, when Harris Cares was starting and even in the, in the midst of it, in terms of all the research and health and social service partners, you know, we, we kind of knew the state of things and there's a certain level of, uh, you know, um, mud or lack of momentum to be able to change things. It, it's difficult to change. Uh, you know, though we know solutions, uh, some of it due to organizational, some due to, you know, just the politics and advocacy and uh, money and, you know, uh, finances. Uh, but I do want to point out the one silver lining in this pandemic is there is a lot of, the atmosphere is, is ripe for change uh, to move things along. There are a lot of organizations, a lot of uh, elected officials that are, are Time to be able to, to move things. So I do encourage, uh, obviously our organization is, is trying to do things during this COVID response on the fly, trying to change things. Uh, but other organizations, hospitals, clinics, uh, uh, community-based organizations, you know, this is a time to take advantage of it. And with session coming up, uh, I think I think we should be really trying to work together uh, as, as Abel mentioned uh, on whether it's uh, on various fronts to be trying to change things that, that we find important. Even things like Medicaid expansion should be back on the table. Uh, very much in front, uh, in, in whatever form, however you want to call it, uh, but in addition to other things, investments and other things. Uh, so, you know, we, we should be taking advantage. You know, people sometimes use crisis in a negative way to change things in, in a, as sharks are kind of swimming around to look at it, but we should be taking uh, to also make positive changes. So just, uh, I think this is a great time to, to do that during these unfortunate circumstances, so. Agreed. Agreed. Well, moving us along in our agenda, then we're going to open it up for community announcements. And that can be just generally what you all are doing, events that might be coming up, perhaps changes or new resources that your organization is offering in response to um, the pandemic, etc. We'll open the floor up to um, announcements. Good morning, this is Veronica with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. 
Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we uh, have our Healthy Kids, Healthy Family grant process open. We're accepting applications right now at the moment and I'll add the link in the chat, in the chat section. And what it is, is every year we accept applications from 501c3 organizations and the criteria is listed on the website to, that focus on health equity. So please feel free to look at the, the criteria and let us, and if you have any questions, let me know about them. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Shalima Ramirez and I am with the City of Houston and I am actually participating in the Better Together campaign. We actually just launched it uh, back in August and I just want to go ahead and extend the invitation to participate in our campaign. If you know of any organizations that need educational material or uh, special outreach, if you could bring those to my attention, I would greatly appreciate it. We are trying to saturate the community with COVID information and we are actually going to start virtual classes um, next week. So if you know any organization that would be interested, please reach out to me. I am already in uh, the Mighty Networks as well and I'll post my contact information in the chat room for easier access. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Don Briscoe I'm with the University of Houston College of Medicine. I'm attending this meeting on behalf of Ken Yanda, who couldn't be here today. Uh, we just want to let everybody know, and you may have heard this before, we are in the process of implementing uh, Unite Us to create a network in across the city of Houston. So this would, I think, fit in with some of the discussion from earlier in the meeting. Uh, we are having four community meetings over the next couple of weeks to uh, discuss the program, discuss the network that we're trying to put together. If there are any organizations who are interested in participating in this, with, in this uh, program with us, feel free to reach out to me or to Ken. You probably have his contact information. We'd uh, be very happy to discuss this with you all. Thanks. Hi, this is Veronica uh, Sanchez here with American Heart Association. I just want to quickly invite everyone. I'm going to put information in the chat box, but on Saturday, September 19th, we will have our Go Red Girlfriend virtual health experience uh, that will take place on Saturday, September 19th. Our pre-show kicks off at 11.45 with the main event starting at main at, uh, at, at noon. Uh, and, it, and I'm going to put, um, post the um, link so you can view the show. We hope that you can join us that day. Hi, this is Ruth Reckes, I'm an MD Anderson. I oversee a program called View All Communities, as many of you know. Um, this is a standing invitation to um, work with us in two of our communities, Baytown or Pasadena. If you have any interest or are not already involved and would like to be a part of that work with us, you're always welcome. Um, and then I just wanted to briefly invite um, anyone who's interested to a meeting we are hosting tomorrow in partnership with UT Health School of Public Health and Harris Health System. Um, and Memorial Harmony Community Benefit Corporation for the community of the Acres Homes. It's tomorrow at 8.30, and if you'd like to be there, we'd be happy to have you. Um, I'll add my information to the chat as well, um, but it's BWL Communities at mdanderson.org or find us on, on Mighty Networks. Thank you. Thanks to all of you who are already registered. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Nadia, once again, with Texas Health Institute. I did post some information on the chat already, but I'll, I'll share once again, we are launching a webinar series as well as an issue brief series. Um, the inaugural webinar is scheduled for next week, September 16th. It's a COVID in Texas, applying an equity systems lens to response and recovery effort. Um, our very first one on September 16th, 10 to 11, is focused explicitly on uncovering racial inequities and um, really charting the path forward for how we integrate um, an equity lens and perspective into our response and recovery efforts. But in addition to that, on a weekly basis, we'll be rolling out additional webinars and briefs focused on issues of mental health, oral health, primary care transformation, um, transgender health, so a wide variety of topic areas, all um, with an effort of, you know, how do we really um, ensure 
an equitable systems focused response and recovery effort across these different um, systems and, 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 and um, efforts. So more information I will include in the link to the entire webinar series. Um, and then I've also posted our upcoming one on September 16th in, in Mighty Networks. I'll include my email as well in case anyone has questions um, or would like to reach out. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Heidi, do you want to go to the last slide? Yes. All right, Reed, this is the, the last part, just a, a call to action. Uh, and also just real quick, people, there are some links in the chat. So if you've not been looking at the chat, make sure you hit those. Uh, uh, look at the chats as some of the announcements uh, pertain to the links. Uh, the links are pertaining to some of the announcements, so make sure you look at those uh, before we, we uh, get off of this meeting. Uh, so real quick, calls to action, uh, kind of re a little bit of a recap of what we talked about. Uh, the first one actually is really important. Uh, so we have many people who attend meetings and many people who are attending this one and other ones. We really want to uh, emphasize and underscore the communication within your organization and with others uh, outside of your organization. So we know in hospitals and clinics and, and nonprofit organizations, there are people who attend, but you have other parts to other departments that are doing things maybe outside of your understanding or you may find out. So uh, we do uh, uh, really encourage making sure you're communicating uh, the many things we're talking about here and other with your leadership, first and foremost, because uh, we really need them to be on board with all this. And also, if there are other departments that are working on things, uh, to break down those uh, silos within your organization as well as silos outside. So please making sure that we're communicating with everybody. And I really cannot underscore that enough that we've had meetings and people have heard this for the first time uh, from those same organizations. Uh, so underscoring that uh, also just kind of repeating the interoperability. Uh, again, if you've not received the, the guidance language, please let us know. I uh, really want to encourage that. Uh, the food survey, I think that there'll be uh, another uh, I'm not sure if it's still open or not, but that, that will be coming back around. If not, um, uh, the progress report when Heidi said, sends that out afterwards. Uh, if, again, as we've done here, if you have resources, again, this is uh, trying to move forward efforts, but also your respective organization. So if you have uh, things that you uh, have needs for resources or you want to share, please post them on the Mighty Network site. Um, and again, as uh, I think has been communicated here, it, it seems like there's a lot of interest in some of these work groups. So those, it's an open door. So please, uh, you know, we, we really want your voice in these meetings, uh, the, whether it's community voice, data, uh, the communications, coalition alignment, policy, whatever, the more that we have, then it's gonna be much more representative of our community. So thank you very much. And please make sure you, you uh, we, we keep this going. So thank you for attending, uh, for staying the whole time. And I think we may save you nine minutes. Yes. Can I say, just I want to add, uh, Tenver, that the interoperability language comp uh, one, um, it's that one is, I would say, even whether, regardless of whether you think your organization is going to invest in any care coordination platform or is thinking about it, or even if you think they're not thinking about it, I would go ahead and share that language with the folks who you think in your organization are engaged in that decision-making process and developing those requests for proposals, because that's, that's language that, you know, at some point, if, the, if, if your organization is shifting and wanting to make that change and in investment in these platforms, that they will have that language uh, handy. So, I, I, we just want to underscore that it, it's not just uh, relative to uh, organizations who are now looking into it. It's also important for organizations, just for everyone to just share that uh, with the powers that may be at your uh, respective organizations, that this is what um, 
the coalition members have recommended and agreed upon and um, uh, want us to <clears throat> consider as we're developing our RFPs um, around this work. So um, the, the language, uh, so we've shared it uh, across the coalition membership. It's also um, uh, Heidi on Mighty Networks. Where, yeah, and we'll where, include it in the link after, you, we'll, when we send the PowerPoint slides as well. Okay, but is it on Mighty Networks? If not, we should put it there. Um, just so there's a home for the, the information uh, because emails can get lost and, um, you know, it's hard for folks. If someone said that it went in their junk mail folder or things like that, so we just, yes. we can just post it on the Mighty Networks. Um, and we'll, we'll post all the links as well to, on the Mighty Networks site. Uh, so for folks, if uh, y'all want to go back and refer to anything, we'll save the links there as well. Thank you, everyone. Yes, with that, thank you everyone for being a part of, of the meeting this morning and we look forward to working with you as we move through the rest of the year. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good meeting. See you guys later. Bye, Sean. Permission to end the meeting for all, and then I can save the recording. Thank you. Bye. Bye.